your traditional archery targets at the Royal Archery or the Imperial Archery Range in Kyoto. And in Japan, they use great big bows called kudo. It's a large, large bow. It's bigger than the English crossbow, which was six feet long, if you can imagine that. So I thought it was a good metaphor for what we would talk about today, where to strike. I have some unusual messages today, and I hope that you receive them with open ears. That is a cluster diagram of a single credit default swap. A single credit default swap. There are over $600 trillion worth of these things polluting our financial system at the moment. You can imagine what the entire cluster gram looks like. So this is a tough topic to make simple. I will do my very best in the next few minutes to do that. So let's get started. Have you guys read the headlines recently? This is a mess, is it not? Recession, doom and gloom, boom, 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 okay, fine. It's depressing if you look at it that way. I believe that we are entering a new golden age of investment right now. In 2007, I made a little presentation, my very first for the Oxford Club, actually. And I whipped this slide out. And if you'll notice in the bottom right, I said the market is getting ready to snap like it did in 2000. My publisher was convinced he'd hired the wrong guy. So there is no way, Keith. It is the new economy. Things are great. It's recovering. Well, we all know what happened next. We all know how it felt. That's normal because the amygdala is programmed to continue responding that way until the threat is gone. So we have to learn as investors to override the amygdala. And the reason we have to do that is because of our own bad habits. If we listen to the amygdala, we typically wait too long to make investments, we typically fight the last war, and we fail to anticipate changes. I don't want this to happen to you, which is why I want to bring this message here today. Now is the time to prepare for the end of this financial mess. We had automobiles, mass production, the computing age, NASDAQ crash. All of these things preceded great expansions of physical capital, monetary wealth, political development, economic, social change. I submit to you today that we are on the cusp of just such a change. Here's what that looks like. We have a period of unprecedented, exciting, dynamic change. Things like Facebook, we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. Apple Computer, we barely imagined that 10 years ago. We have a finite amount of resources. That's the nexus of where we are today. We have upwards runway, but diminishing resources. Anything, therefore, that moves the needle, that moves this needle from here to there, represents an opportunity. It may not feel good, gesundheit, it may be uncomfortable, but it represents an opportunity for us personally, for us professionally, and for us as investors. 75% of the world's economic activity takes place outside the United States right now. Now, it's not hard to imagine who these players are. There's the BRICS, which stand for what? Brazil, Russia, India, and of course China, exactly. In a few years, the BRICS and China in particular are on a trajectory to pass us. It's not difficult to understand why this is happening. For the first time in history, emerging markets are not dependent on the United States. They're not dependent on Europe. This means they have unprecedented options and flexibility. They can make decisions on their own without involving us. Now, in fact, there are going to be an entirely new collection of markets here, the civets, the mickets, and the next 11. These are collections of the new BICs, the new BRICs. These are the groups that are replacing what we knew as the emerging markets. This is not inconsequential because over the last 10 years, the BRICS returned 250% in the first decade of this millennium. I submit to you that 10 years from now, if we meet in this room, that these markets, the Civets, the Vistas, the Mickets, and the Next 11, with places like Colombia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Vietnam, Indonesia, will in fact have been fantastic places to invest with growth rates that far exceed our own. 
You can see that very clearly if you look at spending power. Up in the very right, we have very high per capita income. We have Germany, the UK, the US, Italy, most of Europe up in that right-hand corner. Over in this corner, we have China, urban China and India. They're beginning to accumulate purchasing power. That's all that's happening. If we look at the purchasing power of the nations of the world, we're all the way up in the right in the tiny little dots. But if you look at China and India, growing, big, huge populations with lots of purchasing power. Everybody says, well, Chinese only make $4,000 a year on average. Yeah, but there's 1.3 billion of them. Imagine what happens when they go to $5,000 a person. Just to put China into perspective, there are five key drivers today. And this is why we've got to set up now. There are five key drivers for what's happening around the world and why I believe we are at such a unique point in history that we should pay attention, even if we're a year early, maybe two. The biggest fortunes at every single one of those great transitions, the age of navigation, the computing age, the internet age, all happened a year or two before the market shifted. The first key driver is somebody called, I call, the bottom billion. Okay, the bottom billion, quite simply, are those people who are the poorest on the planet. I don't know if you know this, but 30 to 40 percent of this planet live on less than two dollars a day right now. Less than two. Now everybody says, how can that happen? Well, it's happening because all of the nations we've just discussed are bringing things to market, they're bringing money to market, and they're bringing capitalism to market. Even communist China is bringing capitalism to the markets. So the bottom billion is coming. They are changing their income from this $4,000 a month, $2,000 a month, $2 a day, to $4 a day, $5 a day. The second major driver is energy consumption. We are working on technologies now for solar, coal, oil, that are 100 to 200 times more efficient than anything we've seen since we have begun using those resources. It is not inconceivable that we could solve the energy problem within the next 30 years, maybe even the next 20. Technology for everybody. We have more technological innovation right now than we've ever seen in history. Money, we've talked about, it's a limited resource, which means things like currencies are going to be very important. We've never thought about that in the past. We've never had to. There's always been enough money to go around. But now, for the first time in history, we have to think about it. So the big idea is this. From an investing standpoint, there's a couple themes that fold into this. Where do we want to invest for maximum gains right now? Not surprisingly, we want to invest in those companies that home in on all five of the trends we just discussed. Technology, energy, resources, money. We want to do it generally with companies I call the Glocals. These are big global companies with brands that everybody wants. But even that's an opportunity because it means we can do something about it. It means we're going to see massive change in the medical field. We're going to see tremendous innovation in the insurance industry. We're going to see tremendous innovation in the energy companies because when money moves, hard assets move. When hard assets move, everything that they're made from moves. Remember what we talked about. Plant your flag early. A lot of these companies are in great shape. They're in better shape than they've been in in years. So my point is, even though it's Asia, it's India, it's China, it's parts of Africa that are growing, it's the big companies that are listed right here at home that are the ones you want to be buying. Because they've got the experience management, they've got the cash, they've got the moxie. One key thought I want to leave you with, this is very simple when it comes to following the money. In 2012, we are at a period of inflection. The stake we want to be putting down now, the flag we want to be planting now, is those big companies, the global emphasis, the growing population in technology, in resources, medical, all of that, money itself. Generally speaking, the emerging markets are growing at a rate that's three times our own. Developed countries are falling or flat. Why is this? 
In the next 10 years, 3 billion people are going to join the conversation. That is the biggest opportunity we have seen in our lifetimes. Imagine what tomorrow brings. Thank you very much.